everyone and welcome back to What About A Pollen Podcast. I'm Ops and this week I'm joined again by Lecky Beans of Veg as we will be finally tackling the season finale of season one in our rewatch. Firstly, before we get started, how are you all doing? Are we excited? We're almost there at the end. Ho oh, ho! Season yeah. eight or season eight, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, oh <God>. Gregory! <laughs> Hopefully we are not here for season eight. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's going to be the highlight of my retirement. Hell yeah. We're going to be 52 years old and we're going to be doing season eight. Retiring at 52 in this economy? I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> my social security doesn't kick in until much later. <laughs> yeah. Should I tell you guys about the dream that I had? <laughs> Do you have another dream? Go for it. Wait, does the word sternum? <laughs> no. Go up it, in the, okay. No. I mean... It was slightly depressing, but no murder, no nothing else in it. So don't worry. About that. So I had a dream the other night that season three premiered, but it was like in an alternate universe. So we all lived in like Floridian fifties households. Oh no! We were all living with Penelope for some reason, and then at the same time, I was calling Bridgerton's consciousness. <laughs> And so when we went to like the first ball, which was really crazy, it was like the first time that he got home and I was his consciousness, but also at the same time, I was a person on the side, but nobody else saw me except for him and you guys for some reason. (laughs) It was like when I left the house, I was like suddenly connected to him. And so then he went to go find Penn and he found her on the stairs and she was like, I don't want to talk to you, Colin Bridgerton. And I was like, well, damn, you got to talk to her. (laughs) And then it backfired, and we went to an elevator, and we were talking, and I was like, well, don't forget to listen to our podcast. It's called What a Bar. <laughs> that was my dream. <laughs> Amazing. And it was a joy being Colin Bridgerton's consciousness for a dream. <laughs> huh. So, as you can see, we're all absolutely losing our minds in the Wilderness Weeks. As we said, this week we'll be breaking down everything Penn and Colin from Season 1, Episode 8, the season finale, After the Rain. You know, we've had a few weeks of despair relentless pain and I think we're all excited to finally made it to the end but before we do get started on the episode let's go through the breaking crumbs of the week. Lecky what have you got for us this week? For our fellow book fans there have been some rumors swirling about a book tie-in with a possible December release date while nothing has been confirmed yet this would coincide with the December 14th release date that was leaked which kind of makes sense. To add to the mystery however a lovely sleuth on the pollen subreddit discovered that the British TV tie-in is listed on WH Smith with an October 1st release date. It has its own ISBN number that is different to existing copies of the book so it's possible that we might see that book tie-in as early as October which is so exciting. I honestly can't wait to see Nick and Luke's cover. The mystery deepens. I'm so excited about the book tie-in. If we're going to spiral, because what else are we going to do to fill in the week? (laughs) We're going to be pouring over that with a little magnifying glass. If they do release the tie-in in in October, then that means they might release some sort of promotional material in October. It could be coming. Assuming they keep the release date, but it could just be possible also that they are tied to this publishing date. But yeah, we will keep our eyes peeled. Thank you to that sleuth on the pollen sub. We will link your post. Excellent detective work. We highly approve. What else is going on? Netflix France has also been toying with pollen fans on Twitter, <laughs> telling eager fans that this show is coming prochainement, which Google Translate tells me basically means soon. This isn't the first time they've said this, and it's honestly becoming the new coming weeks. I think whoever's running the social media over on Netflix France just wants to see us suffer. So congratulations, you have achieved your goal in tormenting us. Mission accomplished. Speaking of European Netflix accounts and pollen sleuths, another Twitter fan went back and looked at a post that the Netflix Netherlands account made nine weeks ago, where basically a pollen fan commented and said that they didn't want to wait until December for season three, and Netflix responded that it would basically make a nice Christmas gift, complete with a little Santa emoji. So feel free to start spiraling now, though of course the strike could still impact the release date. Believe me, Lecky, I am never not spiraling. We also have some news about some other cast members. To start off, the release date for Jonathan Bailey's new show, Fellow Travelers, has been confirmed as October 27th in the US and October 28th in the UK, and it will be streaming on Paramount+. Plus. So check that out. It's also been announced that Martin Zimangbe, who plays Will Mondrich, will play Othello in the Riverdale Studios production of the Shakespeare play. You can catch the play from October 4th to 28th in West London. Oh, and it sounds like a really interesting production of it too. I'm not going to be around for it. I'm so gutted. I would have loved to have gone to see it, but if you're going to be around London then definitely go support him. It'll be brilliant. Have you got a strike update for us, Lecky? 
In strike news, apparently the meeting between the WGA and the AMPTP went as terribly as you could possibly imagine. The WGA slammed the studios and streamers' latest offer and basically stated that the AMPTP arranged that meeting in an attempt to strong arm them into accepting their former offer instead of making any new concessions. So they were basically there to lecture them instead of make a fair deal. As a result, talks have broken down again, which isn't great, but we can only hope for the best. In other news, Erica Oakfist, the head hair and makeup designer on Bridgerton, shared a petition for UK workers impacted by the strike. If the petition gets enough signatures, it will be debated in Parliament, so every vote really makes a difference. Please note that the petition is only open for UK residents. And UK residents, this is so, so easy to sign, so please go and do it. This is a real way that you can make an impact. However, if you want to make a difference and you live in the US, we shared a similar petition a few weeks ago for American workers, also started by a hair and makeup artist here, I believe, to boost EDD and unemployment funds for below the line workers, vendors, and other employees who have been impacted by the strike who work closely with the entertainment industry. One last resource that we wanted to share this week. Last week, we mentioned that below the line workers are some of the forgotten casualties of the strike, and there are some other workers that fall into this category as well. So in particular, two assistant directors have created a strike fund for production assistance for not only some of the lowest paid crew members and non-union workers to boot, but they are ineligible for some of the existing relief funds because they haven't worked in the industry long enough. So if you would like to make a contribution to help them during this time, you can do so via the nonprofit go for PA's Alliance, which we will link in our show notes and on Instagram. Thank you, Lecky. Just before we get started on our episode, do you have anything to lighten the mood? A little fun fact, a little bit of reminiscing for us. <laughs> yes, to include a little positivity for this week. Obs wanted me to say that today is the day that many Pollen fans believe to be the release date. To her, I say, how dare you? So our real moment <laughs> of positivity this week is, on this date in 1875, Captain Matthew Webb made the first observed and unassisted swim across the English Channel. It took him <laughs> 21 hours and 45 45 minutes. Congratulations, Captain Webb. And I believe I'm speaking for all Pollen fans when I'm saying we're glad one Colin Bridgerton did not make a similar swim and or end up drowning. I was uh, going to include the fact that I found on Wikipedia for 1814, but apparently you guys were in the middle of burning down Washington then. So uh, swimming it is. Whoops, Daisy. Speaking of Colin swimming though, I was listening to our 107 episode the other day and I realized that we'd forgot a little fact about one Miss Colin Bridgerton and Leander. So did you know, Lecky, that Lord Byron himself who Pollen fans are very familiar with, actually did the Leander swim across the Hellas Point in 1810. And oh, he wrote funny. a poem about it. So I bet Colin read his little account of Lord Byron and thought I'd give that a go. So I assume that he didn't attempt it when he went to Greece because I think he would have drowned and died. <laughs> but we love an attempt to be made. As we, we know, Penn and Colin really like Byron. So yeah, that's funny. Yeah, his inspiration. Don't be getting <laughs> ideas, Colin. Got enough chaos as it is. Well, thank you, Lucky. I think that sums up the criminal of the week we'll be back next week with more but shall we get started on our episode season finale let's go yes let's do it thanks for that but now it's time to get started on our rewatch lady veg wherever you may be can you give us our episode summary i'm right here I know you're right. Yeah, but Lady Veg is a different you've got to be in character. Oh sorry. <laughs> that's great. Sorry, Lady Veg, give us your best. Alright. <laughs> oh I'm shy. <laughs> <laughs> Episode eight. You can't begin to shine now. Okay. Dearest gentle listener, Francesca returns home from Aunt Winnie's. Eloise tracks down her prime suspect. An unexpected visitor brings tragic news to Featherington House. As the ton attend the Hastings Ball, Colin announces he is leaving London. Anthony and Sienna's relationship meets its end, as does Lord Featherington's life. Shit. <laughs> Bleak. Holy shit. Sienna decides she doesn't want to bang Anthony anymore, and someone's <laughs> murdered brutally. And Daphne and Simon make amends and make a baby. Thank you for that, Lady Veg. Are we all ready to let the catch and toast go out? Yeah. I love the couch. Let's I go. Love the couch. Are we ready? Okay. We'll be kicking things off this week over at Bridgerton House in a typical scene of Bridgerton sibling chaos. Elle's harassing Ben about Genevieve, Hyacinth and Gregory are booking Anthony about Pal Mal. Oh, cheeky little hint to season two there. What's Colin up to Lek? So he's busy studying his maps again, and if you've been paying as much attention to Colin as we have in recent episodes, you'll have noticed he's spent a lot of time since his engagement fell through looking at maps and planning his upcoming trip. 
And when Violet announces that Francesca is arriving home, he says, perhaps she can tell us of time well spent far from London, which sounds a lot like he also would like to get as far from London as quick as he can. And this sets up a conversation i will have with Penn later in this episode, which I'm sure she'll be delighted to hear. Yeah, he's still a little bit bruised. And, you know, his interest in Fran's stories from her time away makes me think about how Colin will return with stories from his own travels that no one else in his family will care about listening to. Let's leave Colin to it because he's got a lot to sort out. A pirate's got a pirate and pirating requires planning. So let's go see where Penn is. Over at Featherington House, she's knocking on Marina's bedroom door, ready to tend to her still recovering cousin. Marina tells her to come in, and Penelope is surprised to find that she's out of bed and already packing. Penn insists that Marina should still be resting, but Marina brushes her off. She's very clearly ready to get the hell out of Mayfair as quickly as she can, and you can't blame her. And little quick lookbook moment. Penn is full poodle. For the listener, she's got classic tight curls atop her head. This That's isn't it. her best look. I don't like no. the chunky necklace and her bust is obviously no. cut. It's way. necklace, right? It's like very, very chunky. Yeah. The dress I could live with, but, you know, she's doing her best. We've got this little awkward exchange between the two cousins. You know, Penn's not quite able to really meet Marina's eyes as she makes the comment, you cause quite a flutter, referring to the panic cause at the end of the last episode when the Featheringtons found Marina collapsed after taking the tea. And if the first time Marina stops her frantic packing and she properly turns to give her attention to Penn and she says, that was not my intention. And she's clearly talking about more than just the incident with the tea. She's talking about everything that's gone on over the past few months. And she says, but I am sorry for everything I have done and said. Yeah, she says, you were right about Colin. He is a good man with a good heart and you are very good to him. I'm certain one day he will see it. Who knew? Marina is team Pollen. Yay. What a turnaround for the book. (laughs) I mean, there's a lot to unpack here, right? We can't forget that the two cousins had actually originally had a very sweet bond before Colin became involved in the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And I also think it matters that Marina is apologising, not just for what she did, but for what she said. Because I think probably the worst thing and most lasting damage that she did to Penn in particular was more about what Marina said to her when, you know, when she said that Colin saw Penn as a child. And we know that that sticks with Penn across the next season. Mm -hmm. But what do you think of the apology she makes? I don't know. It was just more of, I feel like, an afterthought for her. Like, I think she was genuine, but I also think she was just like, I just want to be done. <laughs> I just want to be yeah, done she, with Yeah, she wants to leave. Yeah, I also think that Marina probably knows that Penn is Lady Whistled out. Realistically, when you look at the situation, it could only have come from a very few sources. And I think the timing of it is the most telling thing for Marina because it was timed perfectly to be released just as they were going to go to Gretna Green. And the only person who really knew that was Penelope. And she's intelligent, so she's probably pieced that together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's possible. It's It would be interesting if she did know, because in this scene, she treats Penelope like very fondly, like, she, and she's mm-hmm. in good spirits. I mean, that could just be because she mistakenly believes that she's no longer with child, but she doesn't seem to be like bitter or resentful if she did know. She's not treating Pen cruelly here. I think Marina's such a pragmatic person to the point where once the situation's off the table, it almost like the emotion behind it, or the injury doesn't matter as much to her because she's like it's over now it's done I think she isn't holding any grudge against Penelope but I mean obviously does she think that Penn is Lady Whistledown maybe not does she think that Penn possibly tipped her off more likely perhaps and it's like what you said Veg you know interestingly Marina kind of makes this point about Colin will one day see how good Penn is to him and Penn is a little bit uncomfortable with this she kind of avoids her eye and it's a bit awkward especially considering how only a few episodes ago Marina was belittling Penn's feelings as a childish infatuation and unrealistic quieted fantasy. Do you think that Marina genuinely believes that Colin will come round to Penelope eventually? Or is she kind of saying that to make Penn feel better? Does she see it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think she was like present during the important Pollen moments. You know what I mean? Through, yeah. Throughout the season, I don't think she witnessed really any of those. Maybe she sees two kindred spirits. <laughs> Maybe. And because obviously like Colin is very romantic and dreamy and idealistic and maybe she recognises a little bit more of that in Penn and sees that they're potentially a bit more compatible. Well, I guess in season two, she's, she basically implies that Penelope makes yeah, him happy. Has... So she must have seen that, I guess, this season. There aren't really any scenes that come to mind where I can think of Marina witnessing kind of like a, a pollen bonding moment. She was there for what a barb. But was she watching? Because she was dancing with uh, Rutledge. She did look over at Penn. She was looking for help. I think maybe maybe Marina is just trying to nudge Colin out of her life and off to someone who will appreciate him. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, I think I in retrospect, I think judging from her words in season two that she does know that mm-hmm. Penelope would make Colin happy and that Colin would be happy with Penelope. Maybe she just recognizes it within each of their independent characters that they would make each other happy. Yeah. But what's this? A horse neighing out of the window, you say? The Featheringtons weren't expecting call today, so who could possibly have turned up at 155 Grove in a Square? I hear you ask. The cousins both peer out the window. There's ominous music afoot. But we should really take a hint that this is something bad. But to be honest, a man gets out of carriage. We're going to be far too excited to be morose. Who is everyone? Mm. Plant daddy. Oh, it's plant daddy. Oh, plant daddy. (laughs) A.K.A. Chris Fulton. Welcome to the show. You know, it's the man, the myth, the flora loving legend himself, Sir Philip Crane. On first watch, we don't know who he is, but listeners, this is not our first watch. So we definitely know who this man is. You're thrilled. The Louise fans are thrilled. Marina's not as thrilled. The smile dies on her face and Penn kind of looks around in concern and asks if she's well. It's clear that something is very, very wrong. And wrong, it most certainly is, because when Lady Featherington returns home, we all find out that Sir Philip is there to break the news that George died in battle. Rip. Make no wonder he couldn't spare a moment to write a letter back home, I guess. But I think we could all do is something to maybe lighten the mood a little bit. So let's revisit one of our favourite season one pastimes, a boxing match. Colin's having a great time with his brothers, which is lovely to see, considering how much he was, you know, down and out in the last episode. But Lecky, why have you brought us back to the boxing match? So earlier in the season, we said we'd be coming back here, and this is the moment we wanted to highlight. There is an interesting transition in this scene where the camera cuts from Lord Featherington, as he's handing over the deed of the Featherington house as he's making his bed, to Colin entering the boxing match, which is possibly hinting at how Colin will someday be in charge of the Featherington house, and that Archie, who dies later in this episode, is symbolically passing it on to him if you want to read it that way. Rest in peace. And you know we want to read it that way. We've talked in this season before about how transitions are kind of used to foreshadow stories or kind of line stories up we'll put it on instagram so you can see the moment that we're talking about and so you hopefully don't think we're insane of pointing it out but i think they were definitely setting up this storyline all the way back in season one and colin's looking great in one of his old favorite waistcoats that he never seems to take off in season one because he's a sustainable king read this reuse recycle <laughs> sorry and he's also got a lovely little top hat uh, <laughs> this look might be familiar with fans because there's a well-known behind the scenes video with Jonathan Bailey, Luke Thompson and Luke Newton. Oh my god. <laughs> How dare. <laughs> How do you not know this by now? Oh, it just slipped my mind. It's episode 8. <laughs> okay, yeah. I know his name. All right. I just <laughs> There's a well-known behind-the-scenes vid of Jonathan Bailey, Luke Thompson and Luke Newton uh, on this set in costume singing a lovely a cappella rendition of Can't Help Falling In Love Weep You. Lovely. <laughs> I will say, you know how this season they've been emphasizing how young Colin looks when... <laughs> Mm. the boxing matches going on in particular he looks like he's excited to be hanging out with his big brothers you know yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah he does it's a little bit more of himself coming back to him yeah uh one more thing to mention about the boxing match is that archie and colin are rooting for opposite sides as we discussed earlier this season archie is again rooting for will to lose which is interesting because Mm -hmm. colin not only appears to be rooting for will but based on what we see in season two seems on track to support and uplift him and his business endeavors in the future and now holds him like a debt of honor so this is some fun setup and again emphasizes how different Archie and Colin will be as head of the Featherington house. I want Will to hang out with Colin. Me too, yeah. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, I love I love the Mondriches so much. I do feel bad for Will because he has to put up with all of the Bridgertons just turning up and just having endless problems. But, <laughs> but I really want the actor to have a bigger role in season three. I mean, he was, yeah, so, so he was such a fun companion to, well... <laughs> fun he was a good companion to simon but i think that with colin it could be a little bit different because colin will kind of be all over the place i think he needs that perspective like i think will has such like a he has such a solid perspective on life he's slightly outside of the world of the ton so like he doesn't kind of care about the same things that all of his all of colin's like guy friends care about so yeah I think he's going to knock some sense into him. And the Mondriches are just couple goals anyway. And we do know that Will will be in season three. There was an interview a while ago with Martin Zimangbe, who plays Will. And he made reference that he was really excited about the storyline that was coming up for Will and his family in season three. So I think he is going to have a bigger role. And I can't wait. 
But, you know, lovely boxing interlude aside, we need to get back over to Featherington House to check on Marina and Sir Philip and see how that's all going down. It turns out that Sir Philip is still hanging around and, you know, we're not complaining. We love a bit of plant daddy. And we all know that Sir Philip is a really good egg and he wants to honour his brother's wishes and do right by Marina. So he asks her to marry him. I think kudos to Chris Fulton because he only appears in like a couple of scenes in both seasons. And yet he always handles his moments beautifully. He's got legions of dedicated fans. And she does turn him down because she doesn't love him. And it's pretty soon after she's sort of got the news about George, which, you know, Mm -hmm. I do sympathise. But she obviously didn't love Colin either and she wanted to marry him. But I think the difference here is that Marina doesn't think she's pregnant anymore. Mm -hmm. We later learn that that's not correct, but that seems to be probably the reason behind it. Portia's not happy with her, though, for turning her down, but I think Marina's pretty much had enough. She's already been ruined, so I think she's kind of resigned to... doesn't care what happens to the Featheringtons now. She wishes Penn the best, but... Yeah, and as Penn watches on in silence, Marina tells her that she's not pregnant, so she isn't down to go along with these... Yeah, she kind of turns and stands up against Portia with this one because Portia still wants to linger on to try and get the Featherington kind of looked after by the cranes. But Marina is done and and it's pretty intense over there. So let's go have a moment of respite with, I think we can safely say, one of our favourite pollen scenes of all time. Are we ready, everyone? (coughs) Beans? <laughs> what is that? What on earth? <laughs> please let me finish my performance, please. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't remember the lyrics. It says Catch and Toes performance. Well, I was singing. <laughs> 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 I let the catch. I let the catch. I let the. I let the catch and toes go. <laughs> it was like having Luke Newton here having a stroke. Moving on. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was beautiful. So. Francesca is finally back in town, having managed to miss pretty much everything of note that's happened in the past few months, which is just classic Francesca. As Safadi walk in, you can just about catch Colin telling Benedict, I am confident I could last a few rounds in a boxing ring, to which Benedict replies that is certainly something he'd like to see, and you know what? Us too, Ben, but probably not in the way that you mean it. <gasps> Maybe that's the storyline. Will Will does a little boxing lessons for Colin. Do you think Colin's going to... He did say he like, he was interested in boxing early in the season, but do you think that's going to be his little hobby? They have to have a sport as a hobby. It's... Oh, hmm, what's going to be his hobby? Golfing. <laughs> They introduced Regency golfing. I don't know. Oh, maybe like horseback riding. I want them to bring back the rowing. They changed that from season two. We were supposed to get rowing in season two and it was stolen from us. So I hope he rows in a boat. You know, because he likes sailing. I feel like, uh, (laughs) can you just imagine Luke Newton crying and rowing a boat at the same time? Okay, wait a damn minute. Luke Newton is upset that Penn and Devling are getting along. (laughs) Not Luke Newton. I mean, Colin. My bad. Luke Newton as Colin in a giant swan boat crying and rowing down a river. No, no, no. Let's not. It'll be more subtle. It'll be a little, little swan on the side of his little rowboat and it'll be bright Mm -hmm. yellow. (laughs) Basically a, a Regency rubber ducky. And here's the thing. He'll go you know, doing whatever, and then he'll see Penn and Devling on a walk, and he'll be like, fuck me, man, I got, this can't be happening, and then he'll row on over them and be like, Penn, you want to go for a ride? Crack fic, but yes. <laughs> to celebrate all the family being back together, Francesca asks Colin to sing with her as, you know, she wants to show off her pianoforte skills she's been working on all season. We do need to take a moment to thank the costume designers for this scene and the lovely, shall we say cheeky, outfit Colin's wearing. Um... <laughs> Basically, there's a spongebob mean that very much gets to the um, bottom of what we like about this particular costume. 10 out of 10 tailoring here. Oh my lord. So, Colin starts to sing and, you know, I originally thought that the lyrics were burnt into everyone's mind. (laughs) Just the catch and toast part. 
just just the catch and taste that is the repeating refrain yes, of the song. Correct. Perfect. <laughs> you know, I thought that, you know, this is our ship anthem. These are the words we sing out in jubilation. Uh-huh. This is the hymn we call out to the heavens during the wilderness weeks. How many times have I sent you a meme with these oh, lyrics? Yeah, I just... Either the SpongeBob meme, you know which one I mean, or the, the screaming seagull. Like, I send this to you all the time. Yeah, but it just says, and the catch. <laughs> Those are the lyrics. Yeah. That's it. I know. That's the whole concept of the song. And just the beginning part, the, never, never, never. Now we are met, let mother bound, and let the catch and toast go out. Never, 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 never. We're not at the song yet, though. <laughs> no. So, but well, he is singing, he's singing away happily. So what on earth is he singing about? Beans clearly has no idea. And crucially, what is a catch? Well, music aficionados, a catch is actually the type of song he's singing. So it would be usually sung as we've just performed. It would usually be sung with at least three people who repeatedly sing the same melody over and over again, um, which is why Colin keeps singing the same lyrics. The toast he's referring to is toasting to someone's health, not the bread kind, although it is Colin, so I like to believe he's singing about toasted bread instead. I am absolutely unequivocally obsessed with Anthony's clapping in this scene. It just cuts to Anthony just joyfully get. <laughs> I love it so much. So yeah, I just want to... It's just a lovely family moment. Everyone's gathered around the piano for day. And now we get one of our favourite pollen scenes as who walks into the drawing room but our lovely Penelope herself. And there is this gorgeous moment, one of their best, where Penelope walks in, she kind of leans by the pillar and just gazes at him in wonder. He notices Penelope as he's singing. And remember, they haven't really spoken with each other since the night that Penelope tried to warn him about Marina and they kind of ended things a bit awkwardly. Mm-hmm. But, you know, their eyes meet and how, how are they looking at each other? A little bit nervous. Lucky it's your turn. <laughs> a little bit nervous. They're a little bit, like, hopeful. Penn just looks kind of absolutely infatuated with him. What I love about this scene is that, like, in many of their interactions, Colin is immediately drawn toward Penn. And not just because her dress looks mm-hmm. like silly string, <laughs> I'm guessing. <gasps> it does! I was going to say silly string. It I does, right? got that written down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what Jen was on the that The best day. part about the scene is when, and this is some brilliant acting from Luke Newton, by the way, but Colin's voice catches when he sees her. And also just a mm-hmm. shout out to Nicola here for the way Penelope looks at him with just this kind of quiet, shy adoration as she stands there and watches yeah. him. Of course, tragically, Penn then quickly averts her eyes. But great moment. I wanted to say something really quickly, an observation. We've talked about how Penn knows her way around the house, but also... They don't announce when she comes. She's just free to come in as she wants. You know, they're it's just true. like, yeah. Penn's here. She's part of the family. There's a moment like that in season two where she just kind of swans in. She, and she's like, good day, Bridgertons. She's probably there all the time. Yeah. yeah. It's like when Anthony arrives home just as Colin's got back. And he kind of turns and he's like, family, you're off to the races. And he like doesn't really acknowledge Penn. Mm-hmm. It's slightly, you know, he doesn't really see her. But also it's just not notable that she's there because she's probably always hanging out. I just love that they're both kind of like in the same room. Like she's part of like this family mm-hmm. gathering and like, yeah. they don't even know that they're going to end up together like Colin has no idea that his future wife is just like off chatting with like <laughs> his sister on the other side of the room I just I just love how close they are and how she's already kind of part of their family yeah that's such a good point though because in his defense she's so in his world that you can kind of understand why like he doesn't see it because yeah, that's true you know, she's she's always there. And it's really going to be the absence of her emotionally in early season three if she's kind of being quiet. And, you know, the letters, if she doesn't reply to his letters and if she's trying to give him the cold shoulder, that that is going to have to be the thing that wakes him up. And actually, you know, it's a hot topic of conversation within the fandom. Do you want Colin to sing to Penelope in season three? Absolutely not. I just don't see an organic situation where <laughs> it will happen. Yeah, I love his voice. I feel like it'd be very difficult for them to include something like that in the show in a way that feels organic and not like contrived. But if they could find some way where it actually works with the story and doesn't seem super forced and artificial, it could be cute. The only terms I will ever accept Colin singing to Penn is, okay, you know, the Barclay Square scene. Yeah. You want him to sing in that scene? Absolutely never! Just bear with me, just bear with me, just bear with me, just give me a second to explain the concept. All right, fine. I will let you, and then I will discuss how disgusting this is. (laughs) No, 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 it's not like singing. It's not like singing. Yeah, go, go, go. So, humming? If, kind of right, so do you know how it happens in the book? Oh, humming! Let me say... (laughs) Right, in the book. I'm on board with him. Right, okay. Oh my god, please. (laughs) 
<laughs> right. Do you know how in the books, it doesn't quite get to the moment of, she's like, yeah, she's he's like, like, you were dancing in Barclay Square and they don't quite dance together, right? Yeah. They almost do. So my favourite scenes in the books. And I think in the show, if they did adapt that, they would actually dance together. I, yeah. And they would have like this cinematic moment. So imagine where like Penn is like, Penn is like, we can't dance, there's any music. Uh-huh. And then Colin, very, very quietly, just starts, not singing, but just, like, doing a really, really gentle, like, song. And then, then, the music, and then, the music pulls it from him. Do you get what I mean? And continues. <laughs> and you get the cinematic moment between the two of them. He's not singing to her, mm-hmm. but he, like, starts the music that then plays as they dance in Barclay Square. Mm-hmm. Or, like, it wouldn't be Barclay Square, mm-hmm. but Grosvenor Square. Mm-hmm. And you get me? Yeah. I don't say I want it. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. And I so badly want them to include that scene from the book and actually have them dance. Kind of like the the mirror scene. I hope they kind of go yeah. for a twofer and like th- that scene actually happens. They end up dancing. It's my number one scene. Also, I would like the music to be the Vitamin String Quartet version of Somewhere Only We Know. Thank you very much. The moment between Penn and Colin is broken as they both get distracted by other people. Notice, though, how they both get distracted at the exact same moment and they both look away from each other at the same time, perfectly mirroring each other. But Eloise has come over to pull Penn to the sofa to inform her about her latest developments in her Lady Whistledown search. This is an iconic Penn outfit. Um, She's wearing a pink dress that looks completely like it's covered in silly string. And it has a bit of a cult following on the subreddit because we did an outfit ranking. It does indeed. I love that dress. No, yeah. I quite I mean, like it too. It's kind of, it's like art deco almost. But yeah, Penny sat there next to Eloise in her wonderful silly string dress. And there's a flash of panic on Penn's face when Elle declares that she's finally found Lady Whistledown. But it's all good because Lady Whistledown is none other than Madame Delacroix. And she's going to write something in the Featherington's favour. Hooray. Uh, Penn isn't as optimistic about that as Eloise. I wonder why. And when Elle says they should both aspire to be like her, you know, unmarried, earning their own money, Penn says she doesn't think she could be like that. And, you know, she insists it's because her family status is, well, to put it bluntly, quite fucked right now. But I think this is also a tiny little way that Penn is trying to express that she doesn't actually want the life that Elle assumes she does, Mm -hmm. especially that unmarried part if the way that she's just looking at Colin is anything to go by. And we all do know that Penelope mostly wants, like, this life, the life she's just sort of walked in on. She feels really at home. And she can just wander in, like we've said, to the Bridgerton house, and, and that's what she wants. And when she walked in, she saw Colin, but she also just saw the family dynamic and the love and the warmth. Yeah which is a complete contrast to her own family home. And she's probably spent years with this being her escape. Yeah, this is where she feels like she belongs. Mm. And you know, the besties are contentedly sitting together. Colin finishes up his song. His family all give him a big round of applause. This is one of my all-time favourite Colin moments because I just love how happy he is. Mm -hmm. I think he's had a really rough couple of episodes. You know, it's been rough for us too, to be honest. And it'll be rough for him in the next season. And I just think it's so nice for him to get a moment like this, which is a little bit more of like the old Colin that we were told about Mm -hmm. before episode one. But, you know, that Colin but matured a little bit into a happy Colin in season three. Happy but a little bit of suffering. A little bit of suffering, Bedge. Fair enough. Back at Featherington House, we've got some exciting news. We haven't actually been paying too much attention to this major plot line, but Archie has scammed his way into a load of money thanks to the boxing scheme. So they've all finally paid their bills. Jen's brought a special delivery round. What's she bringing, Veg? A lovely assortment of dresses and a wonderful variety of citrus shades. And Penn is particularly thrilled with her dress, giving us the iconic line, And mine is yellow. Where she looks like she's dying inside a little bit. And we're right there with you, Penn. But speaking of, like, deception and stuff, she's wearing yellow to the last ball where she's going to be perhaps running away to do some whistle down business mm. well she also runs away from her her feelings and from her confession she's she hiding her feelings yeah. we've all done that to genevieve's credit here she does mention that these fabrics are ones that no one else wanted so <laughs> pen and jen share a tiny moment of solidarity as they both kind of nod at each other pen knows that jen isn't doing this to hurt her and they just kind of nod through the pain. The baddest bitches in the town, bitch! <laughs> the little fashion show is interrupted, though, as Marina drops and smashes a plate in realisation that she is still pregnant. Everyone rushes out into the corridor to see her. Has anyone noticed that she is holding a plate of toast? <laughs> Does that mean that Penn got the catch since he catches his breath when she walks in? There we go. Oh. 
Pens the catch, <laughs> Marina's the toast. Perfect. I have to think that that was intentional. It's the scene afterwards. That she's carrying a plate of toast. Come on. But in all seriousness, you can't help but feel pretty awful for Marina. I think there's this scene where she's just sat kind of staring blankly ahead as tears run down her face. She As she tries to process the fact that she's still pregnant with the knowledge that George has died. And she's turned away Philip. He will be coming back to town. Don't worry. But for the scene we've all been waiting for, <gasps> Hastings Ball. <laughs> Another iconic scene because the Featherington girls have all got their new dresses and it's time to get to the Hastings Ball. Just wanted to give a shout out to the production designer, Will Hughes-Jones, um, and his entire team. What you might not realize is that this entire set was built by hand um, and is used multiple times in each season. So they, they rebuild the set each season, sometimes using that same set multiple times in a season they filmed this in february so they knew it would be freezing to film on an outdoor courtyard location not only did they need to make this built set look realistic they had to set up a rig above the set for the rain and make the set able to handle water and they did that incredible like aerial shot will also shared in an interview that he and his team actually hand painted the blue roses to match the predominantly powder blue costumes that you see the characters wearing at the ball uh, in this sequence so that there's a synergy between the costumes in the set which i incredible. thought was such a cool little detail good point on that powder blue color scheme though because all the members of the ton are dutifully sharing that color palette to make the night this wonderfully visually cohesive experience that the set designers worked so hard on except for one group who maybe didn't quite get the memo yeah the featheringtons ever clashing with the ton are in the aforementioned citrus dresses and clashing a lot and pen is there as well and fans may remember the hair styled in what Nicola Coughlin calls the hair willy <laughs> or the hair penis. You know, you get the idea. The hair pickle. A long, <laughs> vaguely curled, long thing hanging on her shoulders. And the dress is bright yellow, as she's already complained about. And the bust line is shit. So this may be my Stockholm syndrome, but I actually think she looks really lovely here, apart from the bust line. Mm-hmm. I always like to say that she kind of looks like a Greek goddess here next to the column in the yeah, scene, even in her ill-fitting that. dress. And if you look closely, you can see that she has the these blue embellishments on the bodice and on her tiara so she's very nearly on the theme and kind of rebelling against the featherington dress code a little bit yeah she's got a little bit blue on her i wanted to shout out the cheese man because he was the only one who looked super happy that the featheringtons were there (laughs) you know what i'm sorry i'm just gonna cut in here because there's also this adorable moment with um albion like right after safney's like dance when it starts to to rain they're like and they wanted to go dance (laughs) yeah albion like tries to drag like philip onto the dance floor and Lady Denbury has to like hold him back <laughs> because like uh, he's just so into the moment too. Just want to say adorable. I love them. Cheese man, we're all big fans. It's I love the cheese man. <laughs> he he is the big romantic on the show. Sorry, Colin, step aside. And after a brief cutaway to Lord Featherington, spoilers if you're a fan of Archie, I would say your goodbyes to him now. R.I.P. But we head back to the Hastings Ball and oh my word, this is surely one of the best pollen scenes. I think this scene is going to stand the test of time no matter what comes at us in season three. Beans, you mentioned last episode that this is the scene for you. How are you doing? My god, I love this scene so much. That's when, I mean, okay, that's when my little pollen heart soared so much. (laughs) I mean, he walks in and he looks so cute. Like, he's just, like, (laughs) so unsure of himself and he's looking throughout the room and you know that he's looking for Pen. Like, you know he's looking to talk to her, which is, like... Uh, oh, and then he just sees her across it's the so room good. and like he does like oh he catches his breath again speaking of the catch going fucking round like he he's like oh, <laughs> and then he just like walks up to her and oh i love it i love that scene so much (laughs) and also compliments to nicola she does she does regency breathing correct it's always so dramatic she's always like (sighs) and i'm like damn babe i'm gonna faint with you too because i'm so over (laughs) emotional with how he looked at you okay i'm fine 
as you can tell from that very uh, enthusiastic reaction, it's a fan favourite scene. And one of the things I love is that stunning shot that we get of Colin and Benedict walking down the staircase and they make their way through the ballroom. Penelope stood on the edge of the dance floor, completely alone. She's kind of staring up around her, you know, doing her wallflowering. This is why I think I've always loved her dress in the scene, you know, horrific bus line aside. It's a very, very vibrant yellow, which really clashes with the rest of the colouring of the scene. I think the cinematographer and the lighting team really work to give everything this kind of twilight blue haze. Mm-hmm. And I think she really stands out vividly because it makes her like this beacon to Colin. Aww. And Colin kind of sends Benedict on his way, dismisses him. And like Bean said, he's turning around as if he's looking for someone. So as we mentioned in our very first rewatch, this scene with Colin mirrors the one at the Danbury Ball where the crowd parts for Penelope as she's watching Colin on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. But now the crowd parts for Colin, who seems kind of awed by the sight of Penelope standing on the edges of the dance floor. So it's this really neat reversal. Maybe not even odd though, because it looks like a little bit of awe, but it looks more like relief and like Oh. He's, like, found her. Yeah. But then he, I think he knows that he has this apology to make, so he tries yeah. to, like, yeah. gather himself and, you know, prepare himself. I do have some veg lore. I watched this series, and this is the scene where I paused it. When I saw him look over, I paused it, and I looked up. Does Penelope end up with <laughs> Colin or something? <laughs> <laughs> Because I didn't know, I hadn't read the books before I watched the show, it was just a Christmas yeah. lockdown little binge. And I was right? like, hang on a minute. Like, the, I'd got the hints before, like, obviously there's plenty of hints throughout series one and, like, I knew she was in love with him, but I was, I don't know, I guess yeah. I was just being a dumb bitch and I was like, oh, is this actually going to happen? That's a good point, though, Veg, because there are a lot of points in season one, but it's very much her perspective, so we get the idea that she's in love with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he's been so kind of wrapped up, and we've seen these moments of, like, friendship and, you know, we all know what happened during the water barb scene, but this moment when, like, he comes and searches for her is that kind of, like, oh, he's there with her too, which is... Yeah gonna come to play in the next scene and how that builds up and how the audience slightly gets taken on that build up too he went to that ball determined to talk to pen because he was looking for her so he knew even before he was coming that he wanted to just like find her and and he just arrived yeah he just got there it was the first thing he did (laughs) i do think he he came there to seek her out but when he does first see her there is this kind of moment where he's just kind of like taken with her a little bit and like he doesn't know why (laughs) but the way that they both play this is so wonderful this is kind of what we talk about though you know no one really notices the two of them because it's these tiny tiny little moments between the two that they share that i think their expressions are so nuanced that you might not notice they kind of meet each other's gaze and there's this acknowledgement between them that there's things passed between them in the past few episodes that they still haven't quite acknowledged or moved past Mm -hmm. But what does Colin do, Beans? He just strides his little tuchus right across the dance floor to her. (laughs) (laughs) And he goes to her with such determination. Mm -hmm. And they have the sweetest moment together as they both greet each other nervously. And they stumble a little bit. Colin asks if she's enjoying her evening. He has to repeat himself. Penn lies about dancing when Colin knows that she hasn't been. And he kind of starts to pull her up on it and then kind of lets her go along with the little lie that she tells. I really hope we have like a Penn Colin saying their names at the same time in season three. Because it would be so cute. That's such a good point though, because this, the moment where they say each other's name at the same time... Mm-hmm. This is what kind of breaks through that awkward tension between the two of them. Exactly. Like that kind of is the moment where oh, they're kind of back, you know, it's Penn and Colin again. Oh. And Colin apologises to Penn for not listening to her and he acknowledges that she was only trying to save him from a heartache. He also calls himself a fool, which is kind of recurring mm-hmm. language for Colin. But Penn very nicely insists that he's not a fool and that he merely believed himself in love and one should never apologise for that. And I think this is such an honest apology from Colin. And I don't think that this is like the hero Colin mm-hmm. at play. I don't think that's why he's apologising this way. I think hero Colin is impulsive. I think he's a little bit reckless. But I think this situation with Penn has been weighing very heavily on his mind over the past few episodes and I think he really genuinely wanted to apologise to her and as we'll see next season in particular he takes his apologies very seriously if you think about things like Will or how he goes back to Marina to kind Mm -hmm. of get closure on that and I think it does bode pretty well for season three because you know if he 
cares this much about apologising for a situation like this where he didn't really do anything terribly wrong, he just didn't listen to her as much. Imagine the apology that he's going to be bringing in season three, but also imagine the chaos he's going to bring to it too. <laughs> Penn also tells Colin that if you believe yourself in love, you should declare it assuredly, fervently, loudly. And here we have what I'd argue is the most solid piece of foreshadowing that we Pollen fans have ever received. So I would be shocked if Colin's declaration isn't this big moment or set piece in season and three referring back to this specific scene. Penn's entire belief system of how you should tell someone you're in love hinges on this assuredly, fervently, loudly. And we know that she's going to struggle to believe his feelings for her. Mm -hmm. And so she's kind of given like the guidebook. And if he remembers this and recalls back to it, it just proves how much attention he's always paid to her. But this also kind of echoes back to the book, Romance of Mr. Bridgerton, where obviously the big kind of finale of that is the big public declaration that Colin makes to the entire ton. Obviously about her being Lady Whistledown, but I think also, you know, the depth of his feelings. So we 100% have to harken back to this. Yeah. yeah. The music that plays during their little interlude here, uh, I also just love it so much because your heart just kind of soars with the music. It's like it almost repeatedly takes flight, then takes a step back, kind of mirroring kind of what is happening in their conversation. But between Penelope and Colin in this just really clever way because she's trying to confess her feelings and like you kind of sense that maybe Colin is going to return that energy but it, they keep bringing it back because it's not their time yet. It's so beautiful. Both of them have just beautiful expressions on their faces here and we know that Penn is talking about her feelings for Colin and yet she says it with such bravery and such certainty and I love meanwhile yeah. Colin is kind of watching her in absolute awe and again it's that subtle performance. He's still a bit wounded here with everything and so he gives the tiniest half smile and this reminds me, this feels like a precursor to the look of wonder that he gives her in 206 during the purpose scene, mm -hmm. you know, where he is, I think we see it, we've seen it a couple of times in this season and we see it next season where he is always learning from her and I think he's always surprised by her. You're so right. There's also this little moment where he, he actually searches her eyes when she's talking yeah. in this scene. It's just <laughs> oh, so beautiful. It. And just as a little side note, I know many Pollen fans hope that the show will address Pollen's height difference in a pretty creative way in season three. Um, <laughs> but this has come up on our sub a few times. So I just figured I'd point out here that Nick is standing on an apple box in this scene, which is why she they're kind of <laughs> on <laughs> eye level almost. And you can kind of see her step down off of it if you're paying close attention as she moves to leave. It's also visible a few times when Nick and Luke are rehearsing in one of the behind the scenes videos that Shondaline released after season one which we will include in our show notes if you want to check it out it's actually a very cute and entertaining video if i remember rightly i think that was something that luke newton found really funny when they were filming it that she had to stand on an apple box that there. is funny <laughs> and she was still she was still shorter they're really gonna have to be creative in many different interpretations of that word in season three we're gonna get staircases we're gonna get desks we're gonna get all of it <laughs> oh my god this is it is pen actually gonna confess her love for him she's like she's gonna go for it but before she does, Colin interrupts to say that he has something to tell her too. This is like a classic moment of TV. This mm -hmm, is such yeah. a trope. My delusional self thought he was going to be like, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> it was you all along. <laughs> yeah. You're right there with It's Penn. like what Lecky was saying about the music, how it swells and swells and swells. And I think that is really goading us along in this moment as an audience. Because yeah. if we actually thought about it logically, there is, we shouldn't think that Colin is about to say that now because he's just had a disastrous breakup yeah. and he's not in that frame of mind. Rebound. I think for a second, Penn almost believes it. And so the audience yeah. are brought into that kind of almost. The music completely drops out yeah. as he tells her he's leaving first thing tomorrow. It's so well done. Every component of that scene is just brought to this crescendo for it to just fall away. Uh -huh. And Penn looks absolutely crushed. But all is not lost. Colin tells Penn that she is the one who inspired him. We pointed out earlier in the season that Colin hasn't always appreciated Penn's encouragement of his travels. But I think what matters is that he eventually does come back and realises that when he's thought about it. He does notice what an important role she's played. Um, again, something that kind of harkens back to uh, romancing Mr. Bridgerton, an offer from a gentleman where Penelope is the one who tells Anthony that Colin needs to go away and travel mm -hmm. and kind of have those experiences before before he's ready to really come back into their world. Mm -hmm. Right. And Penn is doing her absolute best not to cry. And if you look closely, Nicola Cochran does such a good job here. But you can see her bottom lip quivering. Yeah. Yeah. It's just gorgeous. And the heavy breathing. I tell you, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for her to heavy breathe in season three. <laughs> <laughs> I am. She does it so well. I'm ready for her to be stressed and be like, oh. I've got a question for you. Colin interrupted her, so she never does confess 
her love to him. But what do you think would have happened if she had confessed her love at this moment? I don't think he would have reciprocated. No, definitely. Do you think he'd have run for the hills? The Greek hills? I think it would not have gone well. And I'm like, I'm Holland, you know, it's endgame and it's going to happen. And But it's just, he wasn't there yet. Yeah. I don't like to think about how it would have gone. But I'm like, in that moment, I'm screaming like, don't say it, Pad, please. I have a bit of a theory as to how it would have gone down, I think. Ooh. To compare to the book, Colin. That's what I was going to say. Book Colin knew that Penn had a thing for him. Mm. He didn't want to accept it was love, but I think deep down he knew. So the way that Colin in the books handled that was to, he was still nice to her, he still spoke to her, he was still drawn to her, but he made a very conscious effort to pull back from her a little bit because he didn't want to hurt her, he didn't want to lead her along. And I think that's what would have happened here. I think she would have told him that he would have tried to be nice about it. He'd have still gone to Greece and kind of freaked out a little bit. But he wouldn't have like completely cut off all contact. He would have just been a bit more careful about how he spoke to her and mm. we wouldn't have all those things where he's you know touching her when he shouldn't dancing with her super close right. giving her mixed signals yeah. he'd been a lot more careful we get very frustrated as a fandom by the way that colin is completely oblivious in many ways you know whether that's a willful obliviousness whether deep down he does know and he pushes it down but i actually think that his obliviousness in some way makes this timeline go so much faster than it did in the books yeah yeah i also think that the writers did this deliberately so that fans would know that call and has no idea that Penn likes him. What us as a viewer can see that Penn is con- like about to confess her feelings towards him. Colin mm-hmm. is like, oh, Penn's just trying to, you know, butter me up and make me feel better because she is my friend. Like he isn't seeing yeah. that as anything other than like he's just not in that headspace. Yeah, because he also just got out of this courtship with Marina, nice. yeah. and so I don't think it would have gone well because he also is dealing with the fallout from everything in the past few episodes. You know, he's not doing too bad in the show. They're going to end up together when they're still very young. So he's yeah. doing okay. But regardless, that's not going to console Pennant right now because she is heartbroken and she wants to get out of there as quickly as possible. So she can probably go find somewhere to cry or do some business. Who knows? Colin asks her to dance and she says no. <gasps> She turns him down. Huge moment. Foreshadowing, we hope. Well, back in September, the Bridgerton official social media accounts reshared this clip with the intriguing quote, Miss Penelope Featherington may have rejected Mr. Colin Bridgerton's invitation to dance in seasons past, but something tells me she will get another chance. And at first, I think people thought, oh, she'll get another chance to dance with him. And then people were like, oh, she's going to get another chance to reject him. (laughs) (laughs) And we were like, that is what we're signing up for. Listen. I, I know that people are going to feel like I hate Paul, and I don't, because look at how I just talked about how he looked at her across the dance floor. But I love tension, and so I cannot wait for Penn to reject him and for him to freak out, being like, why the fuck won't you dance with me? This yes. is bullshit. <laughs> he doesn't take it particularly well here either, to be honest. He lets her go because I think he's so perplexed he wasn't expecting it, and he doesn't really understand why why there's been this sudden turn in the conversation. And yeah, he's pretty like a little wounded animal. Yeah, he does look crestfallen. Yeah. But we're going to leave Colin there. Penn heads, like I say, Penn's getting out of there. And she bumps into Eloise, who's still on her whistle down hunt. Uh, Penn shakes Elle off quickly because Elle can tell she's a bit upset. She doesn't want to get into it. And she gets out of there. Before we leave the ball, I just also want to give a little hat tip to Jack Murphy for what is one of the most beautiful and magical dance sequences I've ever seen. And I can't wait to see what he has in store for us in season three. I love Jack. Jack is such an incredibly talented, talented man and so kind. Everyone go support Jack Murphy if you're working in TV after the strike. Hire this man. (laughs) He is incredible. This is one of the last big balls that we see because season two was hugely, hugely impacted by COVID. And you will notice if you watch season two that there are less balls and the balls are a lot barer. Whereas season three, they'll be able to get back to that. And I think they've mentioned that that it's going to be more of a spectacle. And you know that people like Jack Murphy are going to give it absolutely everything. I can't wait. I mean, I think we know because we have seen, we'll talk about it in our, in another Crumbs episode, but there were a lot of dance extras filming for season yeah. three. A lot. Yay. We think there are a lot of balls. It's going to be absolutely stunning. Mm-hmm. 
Sadly, though, we've got to head back to Featherington House. If you look at Pen as she goes in the house, she looks really, really sad and dejected about Colin. But don't worry, Pen, you're going to have more reasons to cry in just a second. It's never just one thing for Pen, is it? It's always a double blow. It's always got to be she's got to fall out with Colin and Eloise. Yeah. yeah. She's got to, you know, twice that happens. Yeah. We're at Featherington House. The servants are gathered around in the hallway and there's this very ominous feeling going around. And if you look carefully, there's actually this really tiny little sweet moment where Prudence actually reaches out to take Penelope's hand as the three sisters huddle together and worry. And we don't usually see like an affectionate moment like that, but I think they know that something terrible has happened, so they kind of reach out to comfort each other. I don't know how to bluntly put this. It turns out something pretty terrible has happened. Archie is dead. Rest in peace, Archie. More sadly for Portia, the money is gone too. So it's pretty bleak times ahead for the Featheringtons. And for Penn, it's only going to get sadder as the next day Colin is outside his home prepping his horse for his journey. He's going to be on his way. Yes, and he's all ready for travel in a lovely light brown travelling coat. It's not the best brown coat. We'll see him in though, if everyone (laughs) knows the pirate thing. I'm curious because he's prepping this horse, right? But Mm -hmm. what... What's he doing he going? <laughs> functionally? He doesn't have much on the horse. What has he packed? I think he's riding to the docks. And what? He's just going to ride up to the docks, hand the horse off like a kind of, what's it called when you give someone your car? A valet. Yeah, like a valet. And <laughs> Maybe they have horse valets. <laughs> They probably send like a footman to like retrieve the horse like later. If a carriage has already gone ahead with his luggage. Yeah. He should have just gone in the carriage. Maybe. He needs to have his dramatic. Have you ever done that thing? Like, do you know, like when you're on a train and you're leaving somewhere and it's a really big moment for you uh-huh. and you dramatically stare out of the window. He needs that kind of. The drama. This is not hero Colin. This is drama Colin. Like striking a pose as he leaves for his travels. And this is very pertinent because another controversial topic within the fandom is there's this shot of him kind of gazing out. Ah, yes. Is he looking at the Featherington house? Yes. Yes. Yes, 100%. Are you joking? What is wrong with you all? No, no. Penelope is the north on his compass. He's turning to look at her. The geography doesn't geography. It does geography. It doesn't match. He's he's looking the wrong way. Nope, 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 nope. Because when we next cut to Penelope, she's literally looking out the window at him and she she turns away. They know. Okay, I have a controversial opinion. A I do think Colin was looking over towards their house. I don't think that Penn was like looking out at Colin directly because I think she wasn't at the height of the window. Uh, no, I mean, I don't think they were making eye contact, but she definitely saw him from the way they arranged those scenes. Yeah. I think they're implying that she saw him. Do I detect a breakup in the podcast? <laughs> he comes back in season three and does the same look and it's just a call back to this scene. Yeah. And right. if, he, if he is looking at the Featherington house, as you also ardently believe, my theory is that he's not looking for Penn. I think he's looking over at Featherington House for Marina. Oh, please. He's about to go on this big journey. He knows he's running away from Marina. Okay, that's what gets you cancelled from the podcast. I will say, I don't think he's looking for Marina. I feel like he's just drawn toward Penn. They have these so many scenes where they're just drawn toward each other. Madness. Even yeah. when they're not, you know, actively seeking each other out. And I feel like yeah. he's drawn toward Penn. She's the north on his compass. He do- right. just doesn't know it yet. So he turns to look to her. Marina's old knees by this point. You no, know, she isn't, though, because he goes away and he, she right. ruins the next eight months of his life. But that doesn't mean he's not drawn toward Penn, because mm-hmm. he there's moments in season two when he comes back and the same thing happens. I am super passionate about this issue, so I'll just stop talking. I think if he is looking over for Penn, he's doing it because he hasn't had chance to go over and say how sorry he is about her father. Yes, mm. that's, that's how also I could feel. Be a play. Yes, yeah. I think that's what instigates their letters. I don't know, I feel like they are friends and he would be concerned and saddened for her when he heard about her father passing. Yeah. He can't go over to Featherington House to comfort her because Marina's still there. Yep. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it is. Should we just say it's a mix before this podcast separates and we all go our separate <laughs> ways? You guys, we're getting a divorce. That's what Colin's up to. Let's just call it a mixed moment for him as he reflects on the times that have passed and he looks forward to his journey ahead. We cut over to Penelope's room where Penn is sobbing her heart out in Eloise's arms. You know, is she crying mostly over Colin because she can see that Colin's leaving? Is she crying mostly over Dad? 
who knows? I did always kind of wonder why Penn was so upset over Colin leaving. Like she was like distraught about it even before she found out about her dad. Because we know that Colin returns home very early next season. And it's like, surely they don't normally see each other that much in the off season anyway. Like they're used to being apart for this amount of time. But actually, if you think about it, men on a grand tour back then were often away for much, much longer, usually even for a couple of years. And Penn in this episode probably thought that Colin wasn't going to be coming back for a really, really long time and she was going to be without him for that long. But what actually ends up happening in season two is Colin cuts his trip short. So he says here that he's going to start his journey in Greece. He's going to start his journey in the Mediterranean, which insinuates that he planned on a much, much bigger tour and would be away longer, but he ends up coming back early in the season. So you can understand why she's upset. But Eloise is by her friend's side as she's crying and she shows her that she'll be there every day to help her keep going. And you remember, Ella's also lost her father, so she, I think she can speak with real empathy here. And they have a talk about Whistledown to try and lighten the mood. And Penn says, with Lady Whistledown still on the loose, next season will be far more interesting. Obviously, this implies that Penn plans to continue writing, which actually seems kind of like the logical thing to do, considering her family is mm. now in a much more precarious situation. Uh, maybe she thought she would need the income. Yeah, she's got no intention to stop. we're going to join Penn on the steps of her house as her family gather to watch Marina leave with Sir Philip now that Marina has found out that she's still pregnant. She's gone to what is the best solution for her really there's never going to be an ideal solution because her love has gone but she's going to go with Sir Philip and marry him and raise George's children with him and it's a very bittersweet ending and I think you can see that on Penn's face as she watches her cousin leave but we get an added little twist that uh, Varley comes over and says that the new Lord Featherington has been tracked down do they not know because I watched that and they were so dramatic about it look who it is and who it is is just like they haven't heard of a him cousin. before yeah <laughs> It seems like maybe they had a different plan with how it was going to go. It was going to be Lord Rutledge or something. And you know, pieing is such sweet sorrow. And across the road, Colin is on his horse and he's ready to set off. The rest of the family have all gathered to say goodbye and he assures everyone he's going to write to them from Greece. And I wonder if there's someone else he's going to plan on writing to too. But off he goes. Have fun in Greece, Colin. Let us know how it goes. We'll see you around, babe. See you, babe. And just before we go too, we should point out that this is where Antony makes his declaration which sets the wheels in motion for his season two arc. He announces that he's removing love from the equation from his search for a Viscountess, which backfires obviously in season two. And in season two, we have Colin announcing that he'd never dream of courting Penelope, which will obviously also backfire in season three. Oh, yeah. we love a boy saying silly things yeah. to set them up for their season. Can't wait to hear what Benedict's gonna say to backfire during his season. <laughs> he's gonna say something like, oh, Colin, I can't believe it took you that long to see what was right in front of you yeah, yeah. and then sophie just like sophie's in the background like cleaning a wall or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there we go that's it season one poly rewatch done <gasps> yay well done everyone stop right there that's not the end because surprise surprise none of us knew i don't think i knew to be fair because we have I just as l realizes that Madame Delacroix can't have actually been Lady Whistledown. We find out who it really is. We get our last Whistledown voiceover as she says, Perhaps I will come forward one day, though you must know, dear reader, that decision will be left entirely up to me. As we peek into the carriage and look who it is. Our girl, our girl. Penelope. What a Whistledown. When I first saw that, I'm like Veg, I had no idea. When I first saw that, I audibly gasped. I was like, holy shit, it's Ben. <laughs> and, you know, we've talked before about, you know, how much the writers and the team really work to layer stories and to plan out um, the future storylines. And this is something we're going to touch back on at the very end of season two. But actually you might not realise that the, the original plan for the season finale was not to include this reveal and that this last shot of Penelope being revealed as Lady Whistledown was pretty much the last pickup that was shot. It was really, really chucked in the last minute. I think they were going to go down a completely different route Nicola Coughlin actually said that the plan wasn't necessarily that they were going to reveal it in season one. They changed back and forwards a few times and it was actually mm -hmm. a reshoot in July where they filmed this and they originally filmed Super with late. a different ending that would make it seem like it was Cressida Cowper. Um, mm -hmm. And in the end, the choice to show that it was Penelope was beneficial for the season two storyline. That adds, one, that they were going to tie in each of the books together more within the seasons. Mm -hmm. Like they're gonna maybe like- Have more overlap. Yeah, mush in a bunch of like one, two, three, and four all together. But also that may leads me to believe I have a theory that they're still going to do the Cressida mm -hmm. plot in, yeah. from the book and that 
Eloise's friend is going to be Cressida. Mm. Yeah, it could be. It's going to have to be a separate discussion because I disagree with that. What I will say to wrap this up is I think they made the right decision because, I mean, you know what binge watching on Netflix is like? Like the second they'd have watched the season, they'd have been Googling the books. Yeah. Like, who ends up with who? Who ends up with them? And everyone very, very quickly would have realised that it was actually Penn. Yeah. So that kind of red herring would yeah. have fallen a bit flat in the end. Right. Yeah. Whereas I think Shonda really wanted to bring the audience in on that secret. Yeah. And I think that works really, really well. So, Penelope, who would have thought it, eh? There she is, the quiet little flower, our Lady Whistledown. And that genuinely is the end of our Pollen season one rewatch. We did it. Ah! Oh my God. (laughs) What an episode, what a season. Yeah, I mean, whistle up, whistle down, lucky. There's a lot that's just happened there. So our whistle up for the episode is the death of one Archibald Featherington because it paves the way for a new Lord Featherington. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding, I'm just kidding. But it's probably the pretty blatant foreshadowing we received during the Hastings Ball that hints that Colin will one day declare his love assuredly, fervently, and loudly. (sighs) He better. And what about a whistle down for the Our whistle down is also the death of Penn's dad because it is kind of a bummer that he was murdered and this is never really mentioned again. (laughs) Yeah, Penn, welcome to the dead dad's club. I am also part of that. (laughs) Yeah, same. Oh, well, on that cheery note, like I said, we did it. We've made it through season one. Just to very quickly summarise, what's your thoughts the whole season? Was there anything in our rewatch that have made you look at something differently about anything? This goes for you too, listeners. Let us know. Is there anything that you appreciate now or have noticed during this rewatch, guys? Unlike everybody else, I did not watch this season a lot of times. So I was just quietly obsessed mm-hmm. with it and was like, oh, I'll rewatch it again sometime soon. <laughs> but rewatching it, the episodes I did watch... <laughs> part-timer yeah it like made me like re-fall in love with Bridgerton again you know and just how good the show is even outside the Paul and plot line like I just I love what they've created and I love everybody on the cast and if we did an entire Bridgerton focused podcast it would be three hours long because I would talk about so many things so it's probably good we don't (laughs) way more than that (laughs) I've really loved as well in a similar way re-watching and sort of as you can Maybe you guys have picked up that I sometimes mention like the outfits more often than other people. That was sort of my task and my role on the podcast. And it's just been really nice, like rewatching, well, with a pollen focus and looking out for those moments specifically, but also just like Mm -hmm. looking at the creativity and picking up on all the bits of foreshadowing and theming that goes on in that vein Mm -hmm. of things. And Mm -hmm. with the hair and the makeup and the costumes, it's just gorgeous to see the little hints they put and how everything... There's so much detail in everything, like every moment, and the actors do it as well, like Colin eating a a biscuit, like the decisions that everyone makes, (laughs) there's so much detail in the show, it's literally amazing. The storytelling is layered through every single aspect of the production process, Mm -hmm. and I think if it was a very straightforward telling with little thought put into it, we'd have all moved on ages ago. I think the details will keep us completely obsessed. Lecky, how are you feeling about it all? Yeah, just rewatching this season and like taking notes and noticing things I've never noticed before before like how many times <laughs> Colin rewears the same waistcoat <laughs> reduce reuse recycle <laughs> <laughs> I think we've loved the season it's been a journey how we've been about episode eight as a finale what's our rating out of 12 bows 12 being the worst I think this was pretty good maybe a four I was gonna say like two I was gonna go three so we're kind of dancing around each other so yeah the fewer bows the better for me this is another zero the Hastings ball and Vauxhall are just iconic pollen moments that yeah show some respect to catch please <laughs> and it, it always and gets coast. overlooked <laughs> So this is a zero for me. It's been a rough season in many ways, but we've ended up on a really love, really lovely ending to their story in this season. And it sets up so much for what's to come. And I think what's been fun about doing this rewatch is now that we have more knowledge or more speculation about season three, we can really approach it with that eye and try and pick up as much and project that um, ahead. So I think we're all very excited to get to season two. <laughs> Season yes. two. Season two. I'm really <laughs> excited to do season two. I loved season two. I've really missed like Kate. Yeah. I've really missed like 
the colour of everything. Everything yeah. just feels a lot brighter in season two. I'm ready for it. But to be honest, we're going to be taking a bit of a break before we gain our season two rewatch. So next week, it will be a slightly different episode. We just want to say thank you so much for joining us on this season one rewatch. It's been a lot of fun. We've enjoyed having you all along for the ride and we're looking forward to the next season and beyond. Any closing thoughts before we end the episode? What up, Bob? What up, Bob? Thank you to the staff and crew and actors and caterers, hair and makeup, the writers, everybody who is part of Bridgerton that just made such an ecstatic and wonderful first season that really gripped us we love you and if you can't tell this is a love letter to the production as much as it is a love letter to our lovely pollen yeah and we will continue to show our love in the next few weeks so stick around but in the meantime where can everyone find us lucky you can find us at whatabarb pod on instagram and tiktok and come and join us on reddit.com forward slash r forward slash pollen bridgerton and comment on all the posts and vote on our silly little polls and we'll see you there until then beans see us out and like the cash and something cash and let the cash and toast go around <laughs>